Welcome to this, the uh, 22nd encounter on the book, The Theologian of Auschwitz by Father Peter Damien Fellner. We will be looking at chapter eight today, with, which is The Will According to Duns Scotus. And I am going to start with a presentation and then we will go to other presentations. I presume that is visible. Yes. Okay. So chapter eight, I'm doing the first, the first part of chapter eight, which I described as will, aseity, and the person. So this is just the contents of it, and the underlined sections are the ones that I will speak to. Um, starting off, we look at Thomas on the will. So the Thomistic vision of the will is based on that of Aristotle, which is that the will is first and foremost, the appetite of the intellect. And so sensibly, when I sense a sizzle <clears throat> Steak, it sparks my appetite for steak. And then, likewise, objects known in their truth by the intellect are presented to the will under the aspect of their goodness, sparking an appetite for them. I know the truth, and then I desire the truth. The will is the appetite of the intellect. Finite objects attract the will, but cannot determine it. And so my will is indeterminate before finite goods. Do I want chocolate? Do I want vanilla? Neither compel me. And so is free to choose by itself from among them. This is different than being before the good as such, the divine good that is in um, where the will is determined and rendered passive by the presence of the divine good. And so it is not so much free as it is fulfilled. Then we look at Kant on the will. And so Father Peter says that this is the difficulty here. What we're trying to do is we're trying to clear, clear the air, saying the difficulty with this is that the two dominant notions is either uh, mostly within Catholic circles, you have this Thomistic vision of the will, which is the desires the truth under the aspect of good. And so then the other more, you could say diffuse conception is we're talking about conscience here, but I think you can apply it to pretty much <coughs> general, general vision. Um, and so we're saying Kant, but I'm not trying to suggest that um, this is a historically accurate representation of Kant. So his big thing is that act only in accord with universal principles. That is, my act does not follow a... Um, so I don't know a prior universal principle, but my will, my, I give myself my own law that establishes the principle that must be universally applicable. And the only type of a good will is a will that does its duty because it itself chooses so. It is autonomous, which literally means it gives itself its own law. And to have to have a known good move the will is to be heteronymous, that is to receive the law from another. And, but we, according to this vision, we do not know objective goods in such a way as to demand our action. An is does not become an ought in this, in this uh, vision. Whereas in the Thomistic vision, that's that's how it works. Is you have the nature of things, and that that's what uh, guides the will. 
I alone make my own universally applicable law and I alone put myself into action. And this is true for in general, the contemporary approach. My will is not constrained by the truth, but establishes the truth, at least the truth insofar as it's approximate rule for action. And looking at this graphically, we can see on the far left, we have prior universal moral law that is unknowable in itself by speculation. So he says we have to have these prior, a priori universal moral laws. Unfortunately, we can't know them. But one way we can do this is what he calls the categorical imperative, which is to say that I establish my own law and I know my own law is practically speaking in, um, in alignment with this prior universal moral law if it is something that can be applied to everyone everywhere. And so I oppose a law on myself, not having one imposed from the outside, whether by tradition, religion, custom, my emotions, my desires, expectations of others. It must be universal and prior without reference to unknowable natures or goods. So also this is not saying that um, from a more Thomistic or Aristotelian, the good fulfills the human nature. What's good for me is what fulfills my nature. But we don't know human nature. We don't even know if we're actually free. We just have to work with that sort of a working assumption. And since prior is applicable to all, but I cannot know this speculatively. And so I believe that's why Father Peter says this is radically irrational, that it's radically just, this is a good enough practical approach. So it's practically universal, good enough. If it works as a universal norm, it's prior and universal. The famous one that he gives is that you only treat people as ends and never as means. I think we could probably add a few contemporaneous ones to this, such as you need to be authentic. That's a categorically imperative thing. You must be authentic or you must have, um, for taking the example, maybe you could say of the pro-choice position that you must have the choice over whether or not to take an abortion that the categorically imperative one is you have to have the, the choice, whether you take it or not is up to you. So having cleared the air a bit, we can see how SCOTUS comes in between them. First on the Thomistic side, you have the will as appetitive, it desires. But on the Kant, you have the will as autonomous. It makes its own law is moved by none. But SCOTUS can, adjust, can account for both of these because there are two affections of the will, the will or the desire, not the desire, the affection for what is useful to me and what is good in itself. So it's a good insofar as it's useful but also the will is sensitive and primarily sensitive to what is good in itself. Thomas says we're free because we're indeterminate to any particular finite object. Kant says we're free because nothing compels our will. But Scotus says that the determination of the will is both intrinsic to it and as a positive perfection. The will from within itself, from within the depths of the person, is the one that determines itself in a positive way. The Thomistic generally tends to underline the objective. This is the truth, get with the program. The Kantian is more subjective, which focuses on my subjective um, my, my subjective uh, experience, my subjective desire, my, my subjective experience. But well, Carl, I'm sorry to interrupt your, your flow. I don't know if you'll get to this, but um, it, it occurs to me at this point uh, to bring up another issue is that um, whereas for SCOTUS, um, 
understanding of the will as um, radically self-determining, a true rational power. Um, it seems in terms of uh, Father Peter's construal, and I can't see where he's incorrect, uh, both St. Thomas and Kant uh, presuppose a notion of the will as a rational appetite. And the difference then between the appetitive and the autonomous is simply that St. Thomas presupposes that one can understand the essence or natures of things in themselves, and thus the will be determined by the intellect in a rational and natural mode, whereas Kant presupposing that the noumena, i.e. the thing in itself, is not able to be perceived, this is where he opens up the radical indeterminacy of the will. Uh, and this is why Father Peter will say that uh, this account of the will ends up being ultimately irrational and arbitrary, but nevertheless, both presuppose the, that the intellect is a natural appetite, uh, unlike St. Bonaventure and uh, Blessed Scotus that understand the will as a rational power. I think that's important to bring up because really uh, uh, they were both operating from within an Aristotelian framework, uh, whereas St. Thomas just accepted uh, the processes of abstraction to be something that provides universal and necessary knowledge. Kant just simply said you can't know um, universal and necessary truths through the process of abstraction because again they begin in the senses. So he um, creates this um, <clears throat> great line between the noumena and the phenomena and says basically we can only know the phenomena and that is what allows our will to be truly free because he, he actually accepts the implication that if the will is an is a is a, a rational or excuse me a rational appetite of the intellect. Then, uh, if the intellect presented the thing in itself to the will, the will would thereby de be determined. And so he uh, explains or accounts for freedom through this indeterminacy, precisely because um, of a certain place of agnosticism. But it's important to know, uh, just to reiterate, that Thomas and Kant do seem to share a basic understanding of the will as a rational appetite, whereas Scotus and Bonaventure understand the will as a rational power. And so forgive me for interrupting. I don't know if you were going to get to that. You probably were. Um, I think I might have, I have to admit that I really never understood Kant on this. So that's a very helpful comment. I did see something about that there, but um, that helps. Um, then, uh, between objective and subjective, we have Scotus's phrase, esse outsius est intelligere, that is, being transcends conscious experience, which is connected to the insistence on the primacy of, oops, insistence on the primacy of charity over the intellect, whereas both Thomas and Kant are fundamentally uh, intellectualist, but as Dr. Goff just said, is that um, whereas Thomas, where that uh, his system might, um, it's a bit weak in recognizing the personal context of intellection, um, whereas Kant has that radical irrationality. So one stressing the objective, the other stressing the subjective. Um, and anyways, but thankfully we'll be able to move past that now. Um, so then we can bring in, this is the slide from last time, that this first chapter is the scotistic premise, the mission of the sun over on the left under the aspect of God is love. And so some of the things that are dealt with in this section are the metaphysics of the person in terms of pure perfections, the will as the perfectio simply chair simplex in God and man, the theology of the necessary and the contingent centered on charity, the primacy of charity in God and in the economy, which is the absolute primacy of Christ in a Marian mode. So the first thing I have here is I'm going to run through some philosophical concepts that will be helpful for this chapter. And if Dr. Goff has anything to add at any point, he's more than welcome to jump in. So this is a quote from Walter's little summary of metaphysics. And uh, 
up there I put on the side that whenever you're working in the scotistic realm, if you want to have a drink drinking game, you can just take a shot, preferably of scotch, every time you hear the phrase formally distinct. A formality or reality is something positive included in a real being, which, although it does not and cannot exist by itself, can be conceived in, in a clear and distinct concept in abstraction from any other formality of the same thing that it belongs to. That is, I can, in a clear and distinct concept, but not something that exists by itself, consider being, intellect, will. These are examples of that. It is a distinction in the nature of the thing this is the formal distinction that comes between several formalities identified in reality, when one of which can be conceived of without the others before any work of the intellect, although it cannot exist without the other, even by divine power. And so Walter gives three signs of this, of a formal distinction. There's a distinction that can be conceived in a concept that is not only distinct, but also complete and exclusive. It is such that what is conceived is not a thing, but something of a thing. And that it is inseparable from the thing it belongs to. Some examples of this, you have between the soul and its faculties, between the faculties themselves, memory, intellect, and will, which is one of the primary ways that this will be used, between the divine attributes, mercy, justice, divine intellect, divine will, very important for this, this chapter. An example maybe closer to us is man is rational or man is animal. And then between the number of sides and the sum of the angels in a figure, how many angels? Ha ha ha! It's it's a it's a pun. The sum of ang it should be sum of angles, not angels, but it's anyways. That is to say, when we're talking about a real triangle, we can formally distinguish between a triangle as a figure with three sides and a triangle whose interior angles add up to 180 degrees, but the number of angels is unknown. Analogy versus univocity. And so this is an important thing for this section because the formal distinction opens up the ability to talk about univocal concepts. So we have a created perfection. By eminence, that is by saying this created perfection, because it is created, any perfection in the creature reflects the creator and is exceeded by him. So this is the way of eminence. This is analogy. We affirm resemblance, but we deny the... Uh, so we say that God is my rock, but then we correct us saying, well, God actually isn't a rock. And they say, my rock is Steve, and there's Steve. But then, so that's by eminence, which takes us to analogy. But then by formality, using the formal distinction certain, not all, perfections in creatures do not imply in themselves finitude. And this we can talk about with univo, we can speak of these univo vocally, formally distinguishes the form from any particular mode in which it is realized. I describe this as metaphysical algebra, where we have this sort of a equation where we have the divine will, and an angelic will and the human will. And then we pull out will from the three. So we have the univocal pure perfection, the different modes of being, and then perfections, the perfect.
I think I think we lost him. I guess so. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, Charles, can you hear us? <clears throat> Man, Steve, <laughs> that's that's funny. <laughs> Oh goodness! I don't know if it's okay. He's gone. Oh, you're the host. Am I the host? I, I don't know if it's. I wonder if it's still recording. This is a shame. It is still recording. Yeah. Oh, oh there we go. I'm back. I think what happened is the bell <laughs> sounded for vespers. And all 40 friars decided to check their email at the same time. <laughs> and so the network went boom. <laughs> Those friars. Anyways, all right, so I'll jump right back in. Okay, so now we're looking, so that was, we have these perfections that were pulling out, formally distinguishing from any particular mode or real mode of real instantiation. So these are called pure perfections, perfectio simplicer simplex, a perfection whose formal idea does not involve limitation or imperfection. Some of these, so some perfections imply finitude and limitation. Dogginess is good for dogs, not for humans, nor for angels. Carnality, again, it's good for dogs and for humans, but not for angels or God. However, some do not imply limitation. These are things like intellect, will, wisdom. Is it univocal and indifferent to being realized, either infinitely in God or finitely in creatures? These are formally distinguished by their ratio from the mode of being possessing, of the being possessing them. And then importantly, these are completely compatible with each other and at the infinite level, completely overlap. So we'll talk really quick about the range of beings and perfections. So we have being, which in bond of interest, the flight in flight from nothing. And in Scottish, you know, in a loose translation, that to which to be an act according to a nature, which we talked about is sort of the more ample meaning of essay in SCOTUS. So that which to be and to act according to a nature is not repugnant or self-contradictory. So up above, we have infinite with God, who is both in extensively infinite, where he possesses all pure perfections, and intensively infinite. He possesses them all maximally. And then way below, we have nothing. In the middle, we have finite being. We have angels, which are pure spirits, men, which are rational animals, dogs, which are just animals. We have Steve, who is a rock. And then we have accidents, which are not substantial, but exist only in another. And so then looking here, we have a limited perfection of dogginess another limited perfection of being animate, one of being physical, then we can draw a dividing line right here and distinguish those things which profess pure perfections and which are close to God and those which lack the pure perfections and are close to nothing. Then those things which are both created but also possessing these pure perfections are created persons. Then when we speak of pure act, we can speak of it in three ways. This comes up several times. We can talk of it as God, the divine nature, not having any unfulfilled potentialities. That is, I am who am, the name of God from Genesis, spoken to Moses, where we have subsistent being itself in Thomas's use. Being in full, not just in flight, but full flight from nothing in Bonaventure, or necessary and infinite being in SCOTUS. But another way of speaking of it is a pure act, which is a pure perfection in its purity, pure will, pure intelligence, 
to act itself univocally and indifferent to any particular mode, or better, as at the infinite level, a pure perfection in its as independent, pure aseity of the divine being, holy or holy, self-determined, perfect will as pure act, qua act. And you can see that up on the side there where um, this graphic showing sort of there's a, a, a formal distinction between the necessary personal being, which is the real existence, because there's no such, you know, there's no such thing as the uh, ideal person anyways, or then first and perfect nature, which is in intellectual nature. Um, anyways, that's from later in the chapter, but continuing. So this takes us to a charity centric theology, which can be described as this is sort of the, the point of the whole section or chapter which is we talked last time about centering of theology and some of the problems with that, that necessary theology needs to be necessary and common where we have, um, so it's, yeah, for, some, for something to center theology it needs to be necessary and common, then the first, Point of the center is that God is love. So first and necessary being is an orderly communion of persons. And so that's the first center. But then that center then goes into absolute primacy in the economy, the absolute primacy of Christ in a Marian mode, which is God predestines creatures to grace and glory in an orderly communion of divine and created persons. This is first in the incarnation and second in the divine communion established by grace. First, at the level of being or of hypostatic termination, Jesus Christ is God and man. And second, in the divine communion established by grace, where you don't essentially become God, but participate in divine charity. But the second is also ordered, also has a first. That is, Mary has a firstness in the order of graced persons. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and so that was an, just touching on a few of the things that i think would help and then i'm just going to really quick run through some of the sections um he has so chapter eight the will according to scotus there's a short introduction which mentions some of these premises um, that we looked at. Then he also speaks a, a bit about Our Lady and how her virginal paternity and immaculate conception be considered in a way as pure perfections because there's her maternity does not corrupt her virginity and her virginity is not sterile but fruitful um, but then moving in we spoke about the metaphysics of the will already which is the second subsection when it comes to distinguishing scotus from either thomas or kant um, and then we come to the will as a pure perfection and the power to love the good. So this is the pure act, the will as pure act, the will as pure perfection. And he says here, where we're taking this in that third sense, where the will is taken as, so we have to define really quick what aseity is. Aseity comes from from itself, ase, and particularly means, or the most common use of it means, is that the divine nature is uncreated, that it's from itself. Or you can speak of it as, secondly, once you realize there is a necessary nature from itself, realizing that there's also an order of persons in that necessary nature, 
and the unbegotten of the Father, the monarchy of the Father. Um, and so in this sense, with a, a seity, so from itself, also the act of willing is from itself. And so here, act as act, not act as a natural process, such as understanding, where you have an object that is understood. And so the result is always uh, dependent and determined by the object. Rather, act as act, act as originating, in this pure sense here is closely connected to what it means to be a person that is from oneself or not dependent, independent, or like we said last time, necessary, meaning not yielding, um, which these are all in a way, those are both independent and necessary are etymologically negative definitions. Um, so that is uh, another thing to be talked about is the role of acceptance. And so we mentioned that the will has two affections. One is the effectus commodi, that is the attraction to that which is good for myself, um, which is ordered underneath the attraction to the good as good. In, in God, this is perfectly so, like there's no distinction between the two. It's um, because he is his own, he is all good. But for us, there is this sort of, you can say, attention, especially in, in the fallen man. But this is important because the um, root act of the will is the auto acceptance of a good. So it's not so much that I prefer this or that, chocolate or vanilla, but rather that I establish something in my order of willing. And there's this, this is an important thing is that order here is not connected to understanding, but to the will that I establish as first something in my willing. And in a holy way, this is, I need to establish to have a holy will. I need to make the first, that is God, the first um, the uh, the first in my order of willing. For God, that is necessarily so. God necessarily loves himself first, and then in creatures. So God loves himself in himself first, and then second, he loves himself in creatures. He first loves the divine goodness and then desires that he have co-lovers of that divine goodness, desiring one co-lover who is the most perfect, that is a divine person loving through a human nature, that is Jesus Christ, in communion with um, uh, with so not just Jesus himself alone, but in a communion with first Mary and then the church. Um, the will at the heart of a seder, we talked about that for a moment, that um, the full, full flight from non-being or nothing and independence is also at the root of what we mean by will, existence, primarily defined in relation to person or to causality. Will is precisely what lies at the heart of a seity or independence or perfect necessity. And so again, that you're acting, the will acts from itself, it activates itself. And that is directly connected to the person as being from their self, um, which is also connected to necessary. 
And this necessary, there's three levels of necessary we can speak about in this section. The first is necessary, necessary, which is neutral, that is by compulsion or violence, and necessary that is natural. I have to breathe. That's both by the nature of air and by myself, but then the personal metaphysical necessity is the third and the concept still is uh, something that I don't quite have a handle on. So maybe I'll pass it off to Dr. Goff at some point, if he might be able to. Um, then pure act, subsistence and blessedness. So we say here that this first act, so again, there's, we can speak of first act and second act. Oftentimes that means first the act of being something and then the act of doing those things. First you are a dog and then you do doggy things. But here we're talking of act as pure act as will. And if something has a will, that's, that means something is self-activating, something is free, that something is personal. And so its mode of subsistence is personal. It has an intellectual nature and subsists in a personal way. And so in this first act, we're speaking of the volitional being as um, the volitional being as personally subsistence, but then in second act, that will, as it acts, it is approving of a good. And if we're approving of the first good, the divine good, then that's a blessedness. And so subsistence, personal subsistence, is orientated to, in second act, blessedness which is the choosing of divine charity, the accepting of divine charity, which establishes communion. And this is necessarily the case in God, but in the creature, because our wills are finite and not infinite, it does not have that same... Uh, guarantee. And um, I think that's in one point, you could say that's the point of, uh, so in, because they're pure perfections, intellect and will and God, because God is infinite, they are completely overlapping. The will is solidified in its, the will is not irrational because there is a, uh, it's not in any way dissociated from the intellect. And the role of the intellect is per present the divine good to the will, and the will loves that divine essence as presented to it. Uh, but in us, the, we're, we're fine, we're a little bit more loose. And um, I think you could say that one of Father Peter's common statements of the need to sanctify the intellect is bringing those two together, the, um, the consolidation between the will and the intellect as they perfectly are in God. Um, moving to the next section, uh, the double sense of existence, qua essentia et qua subsistence, where we move from, we look at the, so Father Peter says, in this existence shifts in Bonaventure and Scotus from the first act of being, or from the act of being itself, as you'd find in a more Aristotelian to mystic sense, that is first you are and then you act, rather saying that it moves to the personal character of pure act. That is first you are volitional and then you will something. And because you're first volitional, that means you have a, you act from within yourself. And we're mostly speaking in the context of the divine nature in this. 
um, which has a, you could say a pure independence, a complete necessity. Whereas when we then move from the divine persons to the created persons, we're talking about persons still, but in a particular mode. So yes, independent according to um, action of the will, but not according to essence. We're, we are dependent, but also independent. And so that's where it gets. And one he says at the end of this part is that I'm looking at, that's one of the main questions of this is, is the creative person even possible? Um, but moving back to this, so existence, first of all, connotates existentia incommunicabilis. So existence, first of all, is the existence, the incommunicable existence of the volitional um, act of something acting, willing, and because you have that act, it's a fundamental act, act qua act, that is also from itself. So there has to be one in existence and two, you can't, it's incommunicable. There, there's a certain uh, aseity, it's from itself that um, as he says, existence is simply the personal character of the first or all perfect being. And so there's a certain, once we talk about existence here, we're really talking about a person who's existing and with, um, with will, and in this sense with pure will. But then the second part of that is natura intellectualis, that is an existence of an intelligent nature. And so we're moving here from the, there's the, a formal distinction between the person and the nature. And you have them both. And there was a little, one of the diagrams I had, there was a little cycle where you're going, and this is where this comes from is you have the divine being, which is first and perfect being under the aspect of natural and the highest act, natural act is the act of intellection. And so it's an intellectual nature, which means it's also personal because these, um, it subsists as a personal and so voluntary being. And uh, so you have the cycle where, and then because it's personal, is also first and perfect. And so you have the cycle anyways. Um, I think that that's most of, I apologize for not of having a more organized uh, presentation. This is a very, uh, this chapter is a difficult chapter. Um, But yeah, so he ends this section with asking, is it possible for a creature to be formally personal and to enter into that personal communion or inexistent characteristic, inexistence characteristic of the divine persons of the Blessed Trinity? Since this is the big question here, how is it that a created person if we have a charity centric where the divine love stands at the center of our theology, how is it that created persons can partake of that without some way being eviscerated and uh, in a way becoming mere uh, puppets of the divine will? Anyways, with that, I'll hand it over to Andrew and ask if he could pick us up. And I'm um, sorry how much time this has already taken, but um, if he could take us up and lead us to the next two segments or two sections. Okay, yes, sounds good. I will share my screen.
Uh, okay, let me know if you guys see it. Oh, hold on, I gotta move this. It's a few. Shoot. Oh, here we go. Is that working for you guys? Yeah, okay. All right, so yeah, I'm picking up uh, with this same chapter eight and I'm gonna be presenting on the last two sections and this is section six which is the pure perfection of the intellect and its relation to the will. And then chapter uh, seven on the natural and voluntary act in the divine being. So yeah, a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about, uh, it's gonna have resonances with what was discussed before. And in a certain sense, it's almost gonna be a recapitulation of what was before and then kind of bringing out the logical conclusions of what has proceeded and kind of like friar charles said it was <laughs> it was a tough section uh or a tough couple of sections it's pretty uh deep stuff so unfortunately uh a lot of what i had to do was just kind of transpose what what father peter wrote and um i'll try and explain where i can but other than that it might just be a <laughs> regurgitation of a uh, father peter's presentation so Anyways, first section. Um, so first thing to grasp, and Friar Charles already touched on this, was an understanding of intellect and will as being simply simple perfections, or another way of saying this is as being pure perfections. Um, when those are instantiated in God, you might say they are in an infinite mode. And it's important to realize that they're found in God, not only eminenter, but formaliter. And for our Charles, like in your presentation, you described and gave a nice definition of what each of these is. And essentially the point is that they're not just found in God in the most excellent degree or eminenter by way of analogy, but they're actually formally identical with who God, who God is. Um, a certain like, I don't know if you want to use the word quality or whatever, but it's found within the very definition of God himself. Um, and intellect, in terms of the relationship of intellect and will, they are formally distinct, but once again, they're really identical with the very divine being or the divine essence. Um, and this is not so in creatures, however. Well, the finite intellect and the finite will are formally um distinct they are not really identical with each other um and uh so this explains why for instance uh a finite creature can sin because the finite will cannot act in accord with what the finite intellect knows whereas in god because they're infinite they're they're perfect and so when god wills he will do so in an intellectual or a rational or orderly way Whereas because ours are not infinite, but they're realized in a finite mode, there's that potential. They're kind of like inherently imperfect, you might say, or there's that potential for the will to act divorced from the intellect in an arbitrary uh, or kind of whimsical manner. Oops, dang it. Let me go back here, sorry. Uh-oh, oh boy, I messed up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. Wow. So let's see. How I... Oh, there it is. Oh, thank God. Okay. My apologies. So I guess you don't right click and hit back then I'll have to figure out a different way to go back. Another way for just future purposes. I don't know if you can export as PDFs. But um, something I've done is if you're not trying to do a lot of animations, you can just make it all manual and then export it as a PDF and you're just thumbing through a PDF instead of having to worry about an actual like presentation software. Anyways. That's a good idea. No, thank you for that. Okay, so returning. Um, 
So last footnote here, or last point here. So these intellect, the intellect and will then are simply simple perfections or pure perfections. And that essentially means that they, they just entail no limitation. They open upon the infinite. Um, so then Father Peter goes on to discuss, and we've touched on this before, but this is about as creative as my presentation is going to get, this box here. So I appreciate this slide while it's up. Um, but it's a distinction between the natural and supernatural in the Franciscan school. So I divided up here. We've got the, the purely natural. We have the natural in, in the natural of the image, which we say is relatively supernatural in relation to the natural of the vestige. And then we've got a supernatural proper. So the relative supernatural here is it's a supernatural secundum quid once again. So it's, it's only supernatural because it's above the natural of the mere vestige. So here we've got then vestige corresponding to natural image corresponding to the relative supernatural and similitude cor corresponding to the supernatural proper. And this is supernatural, simply speaking, this is where grace comes in. And so it's Bonaventure who draws the distinction between vestige, image, and similitude. And Scotus is just kind of kind of refine that terminology, I guess. And he's going to correlate the vestige with simple perfections, the image with simply simple perfections, here meaning intellect and will, and then the similitude with simply simple perfections insofar as they're actualized by grace. Um, so this is just the basic way of understanding the relationship between natural and supernatural in the Franciscan school. Um, the image is obviously going to emphasize the ability to understand, whereas similitude is going to emphasize uh, charity and the act of the will um, operating under the influence of grace. Um, so then Father Peter gets into a distinction of causal action in the natural versus the voluntary order. So causal action in the natural, otherwise called physical order, is centered on the order of efficient causality, whereas causal action in the personal or voluntary order is centered on the order of love or communion. So the way I'm understanding this is that if we're speaking about efficient causality, strictly in the natural or physical order, I can, to use an example, I could say that an animal um, exercises a kind of efficient causality when it provides food for its young, but we wouldn't call that a personal or voluntary act. It's, it's you might say it's a efficient in some ways because it's bringing about something, or maybe, uh, maybe a better example is animal bringing about the production of a new animal, you know, reproduction or something. I, I don't know if, I, I think you can call that <laughs> efficient causality in the natural or physical order, but what makes it distinct from the bottom is it's not, it's not an act that's coming from a person. Therefore, it's not voluntary. It's free. It's just a natural instinctual act, but it is efficient in as much as it brings about something. So when we're talking about the personal voluntary order, it's really centered on then love or communion. It's a, it's efficient causality, but it's personal. Um, so maybe personal causality is a better, better way to describe it. So as Friar Charles mentioned for Bonaventure and Scotus, they prefer the definition of person from Richard of St. Victor, as opposed to that of Boethius. And so this speaks about an incommunicable existence of an intellectual nature. And so Father Peter just divides up. So I put in bold here, existence and nature. And what he wants to say is within this definition of person, existence is what focuses on the voluntary aspect of personal action, whereas nature is going to focus on the intellectual or orderly rational aspect of personal action. And uh, these will... I won't touch on that here. They'll come up in, in future slides. Um, so then Father Peter moves on to discuss necessary being. And um, for he says that the absolute independence and, ne and necessity characteristic of the divine being 
resides primarily in the existence which is incommunicable, that is in the personal or voluntary character of being. So what constitute, you, you might say, what he's trying to emphasize here is what constitutes independence or aseity um, in God primarily is the personal voluntary aspect of being as opposed to uh, being as uh, nature or natural. And this is why for the, Francis or the Franciscan school identifies being simply speaking with the voluntary or the effectus justitiae. And this is something that um, I think it becomes more clear to me at least later on, because I, I, I can get lost in some of these, uh, <laughs> some of these terms, but I think because for example, I, I was always thinking that, oh, we speak of the intellectual act of generation of the son from the father, that's, a nat that's natural. And then we've got the voluntary procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father and the Son. There's where the voluntary comes in. But I think what's uh, Bonaventure, or I think what Father Peter is trying to draw out is that the personal character or the voluntary character begins with the primacy of the Father with desire or love. And that the procession, so the processions themselves are, originate from that primarily voluntary personal character. I think that that's where Father Peter's going, but I'm, I'm not sure. So in other words, the voluntary is associated with uh, originating from the Father himself, as opposed to it just being like the Holy Spirit in person. It's, it's anyways, I think we'll get to that more later, but I'm, I'm trying to understand it myself. Um, so then he goes on to say that pure act of God, which is the very source of all action and movement, first of all, personal, is also the power to make exist what of itself has no power to initiate action, action or existence of any kind. And this is true, whether we are speaking of the essay essentia or the production of the ideas of creatures in the mind of God by the divine intellect, or of the essay existentiae, which is the actual production of some of these possibles outside the divine mind by a creative act. So basically what I'm gathering here is that God, who, who is the beginning of all action and movement, not only is he responsible for the production of things outside himself in terms of actually existing things, but he's he is first the um, the source of the production of the very essences of those things um, as ideas uh, in his mind, which are a production of the divine intellect. So the idea. So first he has first he produces the essences of things as ideas in his mind, and then he those that he actually chooses to create. The, their, in their existential act or their factual existence would be an act of the will producing these things, uh, producing these things ad extra, I guess. Um, so that's the distinction here between the essay essentia is just like the essences of things versus their actual existence in reality. Um, so continuing along that line, we've got necessary being in relation to contingent being. So the act of power is not only personal and voluntary, but natural as a pure perfection. And in its highest degree, this natural element is defined as intellectual. Um, so it is a power which if free is also rational because it is intellectual and natural. Um, and what I think what Father Peter, I think what he's trying to do here is to show that he, he's he's building this whole thing up because he's he's ultimately trying to show the premises that underlie Scotus's emphasis on the primacy of charity or the primacy of the will. But he wants his readers to know that this is not this does not mean he's downgrading 
the uh, the intellect. And it does not mean that when the will acts, it's therefore divorced from the intellect. What he's trying to show is, is because the intellect and the will in God in an infinite mode are, while formally distinct, really identical, every act of intellect involves the will and every act of will involves the intellect and is therefore ordered and rational. So he's trying to justify the rationality and the intelligibility of the whole contingent order. Um, that it's not just, it's not uh, a kind of natural necessity on the one hand, but nor is it a kind of arbitrary random creation where like uh, there's no intelligibility to it. it it's in the, it's a middle ground where it's, it's, it's contingent, but it's also intelligible and ordered and, and fitting. So, so he says, because this is so contingent being is not without intelligibility as contingent. Although the rationality of the contingent has its source in the primacy of the will or personal act, this does not mean that the creature is any less intelligible or non-contradictory meaning any less formally a product of the divine intellect, even before any consideration of facticity, whether facticity involves the ideas of possible being outside of outside God or actual existence. So this actually kind of, if I'm understanding this correctly, this is touching on what Dr. Goff and I were talking about actually at the very uh, beginning prior to your presentation for Charles, where, um, the, con the, the rationality of the contingent, when we say that it has its source in the primacy of the will, this is because the signs of the divine will, or I guess in Bonaventure, the exemplary ideas are not simply identical with the potui or with what is, or all the possibles in God's mind, right? So it's not, um, the, our understanding of the contingent order is not just simply our understanding of of what is non-contradictory or just what are all the possible things God could do. But the signs of the divine will or the exemplary ideas are really come down to an act of the will that orders those possibles according to what is fitting and, and beautiful. So the actual contingency of creation or contingent beings and the order existing among contingent things is not identical merely with what's possible, but it's identical with what is fitting. And the will is the, and, and, and in God, it's the will that's ordering these things uh, amongst themselves, but it's, it's identical with his act of understanding. So when he's ordering these things, it's not arbitrary or divorced from what he knows, but it's, uh, but it's, I guess it's not primarily a matter of some kind of naturally fixed uh, necessity. In other words, the, 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 the divine will is not like following the divine intellect, like in a finite creature, we have to first know something and then our wills follow it. In God, it's different. Um, the divine will is not as it were following uh, successively the, what, the act of the divine intellect because in God, there's no succession uh, they're, they're identical. So the, these exemplary ideas, in other words, are, they, they come from the will itself, right? So they, they're not, it's not as if God is fixed by some like ideas as if he was dependent on some ideas outside himself. And he's like, okay, I have to act in accord with this. Rather, he's the one who orders those very ideas and so the whole contingency the whole contingent order i'm probably repeating myself here but i'm trying to understand that. i think the whole contingent order then can only be understood in light of the fact that it's made fitting and ordered according or it's according to a certain order established by god's will so that's why the the rationality of the contingent it does have its source in the primacy of the will but it doesn't mean that it's not intelligible or that, it's con or that it can be contradictory. So it's a matter of primacy, I guess, as opposed to one or the other, right? So I think maybe Dr. Goff can touch on that later, but I'm, hopefully that was clear to some extent. So 
Then Father Peter goes on to discuss the Trinitarian basis for understanding the divine ideas. And so basically understanding or intelligence in the, in the Christian condition, uh, or at least our understanding of it is conditioned by its place and role in the divine processions. So rational expression then originates in the love or desire of the father passes through the son as image of the father and terminates in the communion of the Holy Spirit. On this Trinitarian order depends the production of the divine ideas of creatures and their possible existence outside of God. So I think this is just kind of like a continuation of what I was trying to describe before, but it, basically he's, he's trying to say that in order for us to really understand the divine ideas of creatures or the contingent order, we have to understand it in light of the order within the Trinity. And because everything begins in the love or desire of the father, uh, there's a radically personal uh, voluntary dimension that it's not um yeah it's not it's it's not some naturally fixed order that god is dependent on he's the one who makes that order and it but that order is intelligible and rational of itself because his will is rational and it's one with his intellect um so then I have a section here where the voluntary act is not formally identical with intelligibility. Uh, so Father Peter writes that many misinterpret SCOTUS as meaning that voluntary action is formally identical with intelligibility and therefore radically arbitrary or tyrannical or else radically appetitive. Um, this concerns the role of nature above all in its perfect form as intellect, both in act as personal and as efficient cause in relation to being outside of God. So in what way then is the intellect involved as source of intelligibility in act as personal, as cause and as effect in a system ascribing primacy to the personal and voluntary? And he says that without some account of the natural or intellectual as a pure perfection, qua intellectual, there is no way of effectively replying to the accusation, accusations of voluntarism against SCOTUS. So I think, I think what he's saying is that, so natural action, right? Intellectual action is formally identical with intelligibility. Voluntary action is not formally identical with intelligibility. Um, but so, so voluntary action, I suppose then would be formally identical with, I don't know, maybe, maybe fittingness or order or love. Um, and uh, so, in other words, we have to understand the intellect as a pure perfection, as intellectual in an infinite mode. So kind of what I was talking about before that if we understand intellect and will, we, in, in order to understand them in creatures, in other words, we have to understand them in God, right? We have to understand them first as pure perfections in an infinite mode. And that's the measure by which we judge our understanding of the finite and determine its limitations and, and whatever, because whereas in us, because like I said, because they operate in a finite mode and there's also, I think succession involved, it's different. It's, it, it's comparable to God, but there's a distinction. Whereas in God, there's no succession, they're identical. And so, Without this foundation, it's simply not possible to understand what SCOTUS means when he talks about the primacy of the will. Um, so, and then uh, Father Peter goes on to talk about how reality and intelligibility are convertible terms. So the real, by definition, in other words, is intelligible, and the intelligible, by definition, is real, is what he means there by convertible. Um, so in perfect being the power to act or the principle of act is nature and perfect nature is intellectual 
and imperfect being natural act is the speaking of a word or image of the actor, but act qua act, however, is personal and voluntary. Hence, act qua nature is the fruit of love, yet the reality of every personal act is intelligible or rational, incapable of being arbitrary. So <laughs> it's kind of paradoxical here, I guess, in a certain sense. It's like on the one hand, act in its pure form for it to really be act has to be pure or has to be personal and it has to be voluntary and yet at the same time act can be considered relative to nature and considered relative to nature it's it's still the fruit of love and i think this is where if i'm understanding correctly i think this is where he's he's beginning with uh I guess, okay, maybe two things. It could be one or the other. I'm not sure if I'm understanding this right. Either he's saying we have to begin with the divine nature and the divine essence as the kind of source, as it were, for the divine processions, both natural and voluntary. Or he's talking about, and or he's talking about the father as being primary, as person who originates the processions of the the sun and the spirit or the natural and the voluntary act so i think maybe it's the same thing i guess i'm getting confused i i don't know whether he's talking about the divine nature uh as being the ground for the order of processions or whether he's talking about the father as person as origin of the two processions or if he's talking about both, but I think what he's trying to do is emphasize the, the personal character of the processions. Um, well, if I could, yeah, maybe I could just quickly uh, jump in because uh, in fact, you know, he's talking about all of these aspects at once, but he's, I, he's distinguishing an order. Um, I think um, with respect to the primacy of the personal, what is going on is uh, Father Peter's recognition following Bonaventure and Scotus that the person of the Father possesses, ah say, the fullness of the divine being. So in a sense, in that relationship between the divine nature and the divine person, the Father is the first termination of that nature. But he's not a termination of that nature as though it's communicated to him. He actually is the originating term of the nature itself. So the Father... Um, insofar as he is radically first is simply the divine nature in perfect act so thus the father will have all pure perfections especially um memory with and perfect memory for bonaventure and scotus is simply defined as the <clears throat> object of perfect intellection present to itself so perfect memory already entails um a, the the presence of the object which would be the divine nature to itself, and insofar as it's present to itself, memory is already moving or already in act, I say, in producing or speak, producing an image or speaking a word. So in that sense, there is this natural mode of operation. But insofar as the father is I say, already perfect memory producing perfect word, he is also perfect aseity qua personal so the divine being itself is from nothing but the divine being is from nothing as from the father who is from no one else so the father is already in perfect personal act relative to the communication of the uh, divine nature to the son and the spirit so this is where we're getting that notion of aseity and personal act primarily prime in a, in a primary sense as voluntary because the father is already in perfect possession of perfect memory intellect <clears throat> and will and the will is simply the object of the divine will is simply the divine being itself so the father determines i say eternally himself through this personal act of <clears throat> volition now when we get to to the question of the um communication of the divine nature to the son and the spirit we're beginning with the primacy of the father who is perfect person or perfect hypostasis always acting so it's not as though he has a power and then begins to act no the father as first is simply always acting 
<clears throat> in full possession of the divine nature and thus always communicating, always um, generating a word and always spirating a spirit. And so thus you always find the father relative to the communication of the um, divine nature to the son and the communication of the divine nature to the spirit via the modes of na nature or the natural mode and the mode of the will. The father is always in perfect possession as the first person freely communicating. And now the, the distinction then between the terminations is according to the mode. And here is the application of the notional acts. The father, in order to communicate, must communicate as father, what, what Bonaventure and Scotus will call the principium quod, that which communicates. He always communicates through or by virtue of his nature. So, and that's the principium quo. So when you were saying, I'm not sure if he's talking about the father or the divine nature, he's talking actually about the father as the originating principle, the principium quo, the personal, um, innatiable and um, overflowing power that is always an act. The father is engaging in this act. So the father genuinely, as the existent term, as the personal term of the divine nature is always acting to communicate the divine nature to the son and to the spirit but he's always acting through the divine nature because the divine nature is the um is that to which these perfections of intellect and will are predicated or that of which the, so we uh, attribute perfections to god in virtue of the divine nature but we attribute perfect existence of the divine nature in terms of their termination or their existence in a divine person and so here we just we we need to make the distinction that the father is always fully god and thus always an existence of an intellectual nature but because he's first and because he is god he is always generating a word and always spirating a spirit and he does both with full knowledge and with full charity and because the charity is the most determinative aspect of personal action as distinct from merely natural action i.e that which is determined um, by um, its object or self-determining uh, the natural and the voluntary modes the father is always freely and knowingly generating and spirating the difference then of the termination comes through both an application of the analogy of Augustine with the psychological analogy, memory, intellect, and will, but also uh, an appropriation or an application of Aristotle's two modes of perfect generation, either via nature, which is intellectual production, <coughs> excuse me, or via will, which is voluntary production. And because these two productions are perfect, they must be in God and come from a source in God and terminate in distinct hypostases or existences also in God because it's the one divine nature being communicated. And so the distinction then between the terms is according to the modes. And this is something that's rooted in scripture as well, is that the, the generation of the sun is a natural generation. It's a speaking of a word. It's the production of an image, whereas the Holy Spirit is a voluntary um, production or procession that is the... Um, that is specified by the mode of charity or love, whereas the person of the spirit is the personal bond between father and son, and as person is the condition for um, interpersonal communion. And so in this sense, uh, personal act in the primary sense is understood as the father always generating, always spirating the spirit with perfect knowledge and perfect love because he is a perfect person. But nevertheless, he is not efficiently causing the son of the spirit in a manner in which the son of the spirit would thereby be dependent upon the father in terms of an essential order where you have which which takes place between creator and creature and so this is what father peter is trying to get back to <clears throat> is that before we can even frame um efficient formal or fi final causality we already have to understand the uh, unique personal causality that is not efficient but nevertheless active that resides in the father insofar as he communicates via intellect and via will the divine nature to the son and the spirit respectively and he says this is the mystery 
um, that is manifest as a pure perfection in the created image insofar, <clears throat> excuse me, as the created image has these truly spiritual powers, namely spiritual intellection and spiritual love that in themselves, even though limited by a finite mode, an analysis of the perfections themselves of intellection and volition don't imply limitation. In fact, they're indifferent in their formality to being um, exemplified or being realized in an infinite or finite mode. And then when you analyze the um, the um, disjunctive between created intellection and volition and uncreated intellection and volition, you will understand then that the created or contingent or finite mode of these actions depend <clears throat> in an essential order by dint of an analysis of the principle of sufficient reason on these pure perfections being eternally realized in God himself as the very ground for um, how these things come about in the created order. <clears throat> and so I think I think you're you're hitting right on, on, on the mystery. I think the difference here is that uh, what Bonaventure and Scotus are trying to get back to is a notion of being that isn't dependent upon an analogy that is based upon an act potency metaphysics, wherein act and potency are uh, really distinct in the manner that substance and accidents are really distinct. Because in the act potency metaphysics, you begin with well, you begin with a notion of act that has a certain potency towards other actions. Whereas, whereas with uh, the Franciscan school, they're trying to begin with not uh, an analysis of action in relation to potency, but an analysis of the fully, as Father Peter says, the fully personal character of action, which entails a reduction ultimately to this aseity and self determination that simply is the explanation as being the first of everything that comes after, whether in God or outside of God. In God, it all reduces to the Father, who is always simply in act as um, perfectly personal and thus perfectly communicating the divine nature to the Son and the Spirit. And then with respect to creation, because the Father, Son, and the Spirit all possess all the perfections of the divine nature, including intellect and will, and thus omnipotence, then the Father, Son, and Spirit in union act to create um, substances or realities ad extra. But I think that the, the, the key point here is that you really can't get to the nature of person and act unless you understand that unique kind of independent secundum quid, that aseity of the created person relative or the created image relative to the vestiges and even the created images um aseity or independence relatively speaking with respect to any particular object because uh with the franciscan tradition um <clears throat> the 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 object of the will is not simply the good in terms of its commonality but every object of the will will be a con a, a particular good and so the will can actually choose self over its source. It can choose to worship itself over God on the basis of this um, self-determination to accept the image rather than the creator of the image. And so there's a, a mysterious independence of the created image with respect to um, any items that the created image can choose uh, to, to follow. And that mirrors in reality in a vertical and imperfect way, uh, bringing in what uh, Friar Charles mentioned about the effectus uh, comedy and the effects, uh, the effectus justitiae, um, the created image is always going to be working in and through this dual affection, the good for me and my own flourishing vis-a-vis -vis the good in itself and for its own sake. And <clears throat> I think these are these are important distinctions to keep in mind when trying to understand what Father Peter is getting at when he's talking about uh, the um, question of person and nature in in God in the Trinity, but also the question of person and nature in the economy and the possibility of even the creation of uh, a created person that is truly free with respect to um, 
accepting God's will or rejecting God's will. That was great. No, thank you for that, Dr. Goff. That uh, clarifies a lot and uh, definitely uh, something that will take time to reflect on for sure <laughs> to be able to grasp that more. Um, I think I think it'd be helpful to uh, at some point, you know, in your own reading, go back and look over um, uh, sections five and six in chapter eight, because um, that will give you the clues to see um, why and how um, Bonaventure and Scotus take a different approach to the question of being than does uh, St. Thomas. Um, there, Bonaventure's and Scotus's definition of being opens itself inherently to uh, an analysis of being in terms of the univocal concept and the disjunctive transcendentals, whereas St. Thomas's account uh, opens itself up or is tied to um, an act potency metaphysics that then has to be applied by analogy alone, not univocally to God, because clearly in God, um, there is no real distinction between act and potency because there is no act. But if you just look at the definition of St. Thomas or the Thomistic definition as Father Peter gives it, he writes, the Thomistic definition of being, ens est cuius actus est esse, is uh, being is that whose act is to exist, whose act is to exist. So we're beginning from act and terminating in existence. And for Scotus, he begins with a more general notion. He says, ens est cui non repugnat esse. So, as Father uh, Friar Charles mentioned earlier, being is that to which um, real existence in terms of a nature is not contradictory. And so what SCOTUS is opening up upon is that the emphasis we want to give is the prim primordiality or the primitas or the primacy of being as a say and self-determining before we engage in analysis of being in terms of act and potency. It's only by understanding the firstness of being, which ultimately reduces to the Father in the Godhead, that we thereby can even begin to explain how uh, efficient causality works. Uh, there's a great quote from Newman in one of his letters that you know he's dealing with Hume and the whole is ought issue <clears throat> with um, um, both Immanuel Kant, but also and especially David Hume. He says, that which you call efficient causes, I call effective wills. And Father Peter takes that on wholeheartedly, and he says, any explanation of the four causes of Aristotle, especially efficient formal and final causality, already presuppose this personal independence and self-determination in God, and then it's mirroring in terms of its recognition and its activation in the image in creation. Um, so I think uh, uh, sections five and six are, they're really difficult. Um, but I think they get to the heart and they unveil through uh, contemplation of what Father Peter's saying, the fundamental, the most fundamental differences metaphysically between the um, what, what you should what, what one might call the naturalistic approach versus the personalist approach. Because the whole issue for um, Bonaventure Scotus and Father Peter is that personal causality is not reducible to some form of natural or physical causality, i.e efficient or formal causality. It's something prior, and this is something demonstrated in the mystery of personal freedom and independence in the created order, but it's ratified and fully resolved and the, that, that uh, resolutio plena of St. Bonaventure and understanding the order of originations in the Godhead, because what you have is the Father is truly acting personally to communicate the divine nature, but the Father is not acting in terms of an efficient cause or a formal cause or a final cause, because all of those entail composition and dependency. So you have to get to some notion of what the firstness of aseity is and how that is then mirrored. And he locates this firstness of aseity primarily in the self-determination the, that is identical with the radical infinity and intensive infinity of God himself. He identifies this aseity in terms of the will, because the will is that which is a voluntary power and thus manifests most perfectly, kind of elides into what personal, personal causality is. But this personal causality, again, is not something that is 
primarily efficient. And this gets to the second point uh, that is important with uh, section six is because when you, when you analyze rationality in terms of the pure perfections of intellect and will, and, the, and then having will being distinguished from intellect as voluntary mode from natural mode, and you abstract these perfections from created images that possess these same perfections, well, then you're beginning to understand how the created image can be created objectively kapax dei, because he's created to know and he's created to love truly in this self-determining way, like God loves, but he can't actualize that love in terms of its object or ultimate term, namely love of God himself as God accepts that love in the spirit without the instrument of created grace, something disposing and enabling that will to act in this fully personal way that is not efficient, efficiently or formally causal, but nevertheless truly an activity and truly uh, a realization of not a commonality of kind or an aggregation of individuals, but an entrance into that same interpersonal communion that the Father and the Son have in the Spirit through that same Spirit. And this is why uh, created grace founded upon the absolute predestination of Christ through Mary is so important because what you have realized in Christ is again the perfect personification of a created nature with the per pure perfections of intellect and will operating in a fully graced mode in Christ, the hypostatic union. And then in Mary, you have the perfect personalization of a finite person operating in terms of these same perfections, elevated through created grace, precisely in order to receive the uncreated grace of the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is simply, the gift of the Holy Spirit is simply the communion of Father and Son extended to the economy. So Mary, by the activation through grace and the elevation of her pure perfections to the mode of similitude or the actualization of these simple or pure perfections uh, by grace, she enters into that same communion that the Father and the Son have in the Spirit, precisely because there is the formal identity of powers, pure perfections, across the disjunctive mode. The, the formal identity allows for the capacity and then the personal activity, causality, appropriated to the spirit, allows for the realization. Okay. Uh, I just, I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking. Uh, Father Peter calls this personal relation something different from a kind of natural communion, insofar as the personal relation has an I-thou component, where persons are relating as persons, forming a we. And a natural community just simply um, bespeaks of a common participation in some object or good. Now, both are true, but it's precisely the natural community in sharing the common object of love, namely the, the divine good for its own sake, that is the condition for the interpersonal relationship to take place without changing the essential nature of either God or the created image. And it gets back to this mystery of aseity and primitas in the Father. Okay. Well, that was, uh, I don't think I have to do my present. I think that was the <laughs> conclusion of my presentation right there. <laughs> that was really good. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's, uh, I think in order to, for, to really grasp this book, it really kind of presupposes that you've got a good grasp on uh, Bonaventure and Scotus. And I think, uh, I think that's where my, uh, <laughs> my difficulty lies is not having been uh, formed in that kind of background is that when you, when you go to read Father Peter, it's, at least for me, it becomes very difficult without having at least studied it or at least taken courses, let's say, at, at length on Bonaventure and, and SCOTUS or not having that kind of background because you don't really know the way they, they think. You know, like when I studied at Franciscan, it was all 
the the classes that we did take that were scholastic in character was was Thomas. And so that's all you get exposed to. And that's the only way you you learn to think theologically, I guess. And so when you're <laughs> when you're going to to learn it from a whole different angle and all all these uh different aspects of approach or at least different emphases and stuff like that, whether primacy of will and intellect or uh different uh understanding of causality or the emphasis on exemplary causality or all these things it's like it's all new it's it's kind of like <laughs> reworking yeah. through it and it's almost like changing the way you you think or the way you were accustomed to thinking about it and yeah yeah it it's i they they are i think at heart or uh, at the root uh irreconcilable or irreducibly distinct uh, metaphysical systems, um, the the Franciscan Bonaventuro Scotistic approach versus the Thomistic approach, uh, and I think you have to, I think it's, I think you need to in order to understand fully. And, and I, I think Father lays enough breadcrumbs down in the in these in this chapter to work it out, but it's not going to be worked out on the first, second, or third reading, um, very likely. And uh, it might be simpler just simply to uh, go back and look at i think i think one of the best introductory texts into getting into the way father peter is thinking and then to understand the metaphysics uh at work or being presupposed and employed in um bonaventure and scotus again is that i can't highly uh, i can't highly enough recommend the de mysterio trinitatis of bonaventure and you know i would also uh recommend uh, my little contribution to it as well i think that's helpful and at least stating the main lines of difference, if not giving a full explanation, you'll you'll at least see where they're coming from, and say, okay, this is where Bonaventure is beginning. This is how he understands being as a personal act rather than being as active existence, on the analogy of aseity versus act potency. And so this, I mean, this motivates everything. Everything flows from this. Um, metaphysically speaking, even, even if not epistemologically speak, speaking, everything flows from this fundamental difference. Now, Bonaventure and Scotus work back to this foundation from um, basically uh, univocal being and disjunctive transcendentals. They work back to this, right? But they're already working within a long tradition of patristic and biblical um, precedent as well. And so it's not like they're creating it from above, but in the 13th century, we find a part, you know, the, 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 the initial flowering and perhaps even the finest or fullest flowering of speculation about the Trinity in terms of origination, um, relation, and what the nature of personhood is. And you find two very distinctly uh, demarcated and outlined schools in the developing Franciscan versus the developing Thomistic schools, which became dominant. Uh, at the time in which St. Bonaventure's uh, Blessed Dunsko to St. Thomas uh, were writing, there wasn't yet worked out an articulated theology of a lot of these questions based upon the application of a consistent metaphysical and logical apparatus. A lot of this was worked out in the 13th century going forward. And you see um, the Franciscan approach and the Dominican approach become the two dominant approaches to this question. But before that, um, theological and metaphysical speculation on this level simply did not take place. You know, the, the, the last flowering of this kind of speculation prior to the <clears throat> mid 13th century going forward was probably the uh, post Chalcedonian period in the Greek church in the sixth through eighth centuries. And then really the, the, the speculative kind of work being done in the period of high scholasticism uh, just simply didn't exist. And so ironically, the, the, when the Latins are working out the question of the filioque, they're actually having to work out the theology of it, not, not the dogmatic fact of it, but the theology of it, because they hadn't worked it out. And interestingly, at the same time, the Greeks were working it out too, in opposition or in reaction to the addition of the uh, filioque to the creed. <clears throat> and so, yeah, I think, uh, I think the disputed questions on the mystery of the Trinity are, are very helpful or getting into in a more simplified and succinct way the uh, 
common metaphysics insofar as it is common in the whole Franciscan school. Now the Franciscan school is much more eclectic, but yet there are these common themes and emphases that the greatest uh, doctors and theologians of that school uh, follow. And Bonaventure is laying a lot of that out in the De Mysterio in a succinct form. I think questions three and four and seven and eight are foundational to uh, to picking up uh, what SCOTUS later does and what Father Peter is doing here. I guess, um, yeah, I, I should probably uh, leave it off at that. One thing I wanted to note uh, really quickly on page 212, it's uh, interestingly because in that paragraph you mentioned that voluntary action is formally identical with the intelligibility of that issue. I'll just read this passage and then uh, provide a quick comment on it. He says, um, precisely because so many interpret SCOTUS as meaning that voluntary action is formally identical with intelligibility and therefore radically arbitrary or tyrannical or else radically appetitive. What Father Peter is um, hearkening back to is what uh, he laid out at the beginning of this chapter and what Father, I mean, Friar Charles explained in terms of the Thomistic approach or rather the Kantian approach and the Thomistic approach. What he's, what he's locating here is that because of this misinterpretation of SCOTUS, people tend to want to take SCOTUS either in a Kantian sense, radically arbitrary, or more in a Thomistic sense, radically appetitive. And he's saying, no, this is, uh, this is not the way to understand him. So, um, you know, just, just highlighting that he's recapitulating and bringing forward his prior discussion in the same chapter when he distinguishes between uh, Immanuel Kant and St. Thomas Aquinas and then provides SCOTUS as an alternate uh, explanation. So uh, perhaps that would be uh, helpful, I thought, to bring up. Okay, so in that section then is, so... He is saying that SCOTUS does not um, does not mean that voluntary action is formally identical with intelligibility. Then that's a true statement that he he does not identify that. So what then does he identify? So what what would SCOTUS then for what would be uh, voluntary action? What would it be formally identical with? As a voluntary, to- well, the natural action um, is generically defined as the object determines the power. So uh, the natural action, the highest or spiritual mode of natural activity is intellection. So thus when um, some true proposition or so, some um, objective state of the fair, of affairs presents itself to the intellect, the intellect cannot help but to assent or to recognize or to represent that item of knowledge under consideration. So the intellect is presented again, simple proposition, uh, two plus two equals four. When the intellect understands the nature of the proposition and its parts and the way they fit together, the intellect is determined by that object to then know and represent or speak a mental word, have a concept that two plus two equals four. That is the natural mode of activity. The voluntary mode of activity is not so much uh, determined by its object, but rather is self-determining with respect to the object. So instead of two plus two equals four, which is a relatively unlovable type of statement, but very important, um, you might say that um, uh, God as infinite goodness is to be loved above all things for his own sake. Now, the intellect, when it understands that term, cannot help but assent to the truth of that proposition, right? It's informed by that proposition. If it understands the terms, it cannot help but to agree. That's the very structure of reality. And it's the object there, the object of knowledge is determining the intellect. And the intellect is brought in conformity to it. Now, the, the will on the flip side, even if this is a necessary action, as it is, in, as it is with God, the will is not determined by the object. The will is auto-determining to say, yes, I accept that truth and I love that truth. Does that make sense? So the formal, the, is for, the voluntary action is formally identical to aseity or self-determination, whereas the natural action is formally identical to um, determination by the object. So voluntary, okay. self-determining, natural, determined by the object. And Father Peter says, it's simply impossible to avoid the conclusion that when you're talking about God, and when you're talking about God as personal, 
you have to reduce it to this aseity, this self-determination, because self-determination is what explains the possibility for any other types of actions, because it's most personal and it's originative in the radical sense. Self-determination, not being determined by something else. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> so the father, so the father as the first person, and hence the first unoriginate possessor of the divine nature he has infinite knowledge right mm. so in that sense his natural power of intellection is determined by the object infinite goodness god knows his own being and he knows everything that is possible to that being mm. right but because but because god the father is already personal that knowledge of god is nested within his personal agency as unoriginate as the first and primordial person that explains all else so wherein we speak a word in order to come to knowledge right we have sensory experience we go through the process of abstraction we have a mental concept and then we have we have an impressed species right we have this knowledge that becomes habitual we speak that word in order to come to knowledge in order for, in order to move from a state of ignorance to a state of sciencia ignorant ignorancia to sciencia the father it's the inverse, because the Father is simply God, Ase. He speaks a word not in order to know. He speaks a word in order, no, he speaks a word because he knows. So the order of operation, the, 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 there, there's a parallel in, in memory and speaking, right? But there's an inverse, because we speak in order to know. God speaks because he does know. So you can see the structure is memory, intellect, will, but the order or the explanation of why those things come about are the inverse. God speaks because he knows, so therefore in his speaking, he's the principle of all knowledge. We're not the principle of all knowledge, but like, the, like God, we have memory and intellect. And so we move from a state of memory to intellect, from, from dispo, disposition to actual speaking. But we do it because we're limited. And through this speaking, we become more perfect through gaining greater knowledge. The Father is already perfect, and he's already perfectly free and perfectly loving. And because he is perfectly free and perfectly loving, he speaks because he knows. Mm -hmm. And so this is where Bonaventure in um, <clears throat> question seven of the De Mysterio Trinitatis, he makes these important distinctions between the voluntas achedens, the voluntas antichedens, and the vol voluntas achedens. And he says, all of these are true voluntary acts, but the voluntas achedens is this um, punctuated um, act of, of, of willing, moving from a state of non-willing to, or non-volition to actual volition. The Father never moves, or God in himself, because God is sourced in the Father, never moves from a state of non-willing to willing. He's always willing, because he's always ase. That's his being, is always to be, in personal act of willing, uh, knowing, therefore, and loving. <clears throat> and so the Father doesn't have a voluntas achedens. The, 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 the Father and creatures, or excuse me, God and creatures, share by analogy the voluntas antichedens, which implies uh, in God the movement of uh, providential willing. There's a providential ordering uh, uh, with respect to the, the order of history at extra. We have a voluntas antichedens insofar as we will, um, now I'm sitting in my desk and I will to go to the store later. That's, a, that's an antecedent will with a later consequence, right? And both of those have a relationship of dependency and deficient causality. God with respect to creation, ourselves with respect to um, our actions. But the, 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 the mystery of of the uh, of the will is ultimately rooted in the voluntas achaptens, and this is this is the accepting will, where the will, even though necessarily in God, acts. Nevertheless, that self-determining acceptance of the good that is God, and of the good that God can create at extra, this is something that is not essentially productive or efficiently causal, but nevertheless, it's personal activity. And this is the mystery ultimately of the father in terms of his primitas in communicating 
the divine being to the Son and the Spirit. He does it primarily through this voluntas acceptans. There's a necessity, but there's still a perfect freedom because freedom is defined not by alternate possibilities amongst contingent items, but freedom is specified by self-determination. So even if that self-determination is necessary, it's still free. Now in the creature, we cannot achieve this mode of willing apart from grace. But remember the great moments in um, biblical history. You have, and God said, let there be, right? Now this was his efficient um, antecedent causing, but it's already rooted in his accepting will eternally, freely, um, ex freely preferring, freely, freely receiving all those goods that he is in himself and that he can, um, he can work uh, at extra. And then in Jesus in the garden, he says, you know, not my will, but thy will. And Mary, even before that, in let it be, let it be done according to, let it be done unto me according to your will, right? This is the, this is the, the, these are the exemplary moments of the accepting will, the voluntas acceptans in creation. It's not an efficient causal will, but it's actually an accepting will of the will of the Father. So our will is being brought into conformity through grace and through the uncreated gift of the Spirit in order to accept the will of the Father. And this is where we get into this discussion of obedience and obedience ultimately rooted in the aseity of the Father. Um, uh, obedience in the economy is ultimately round, bound up with the primitas of the Father, the authority of the Father. And this is why it can be called blind and unconditional, because we've already accepted that the Father is um, perfect goodness, and that his will as being identical radically with the divine being itself is, it, it needs no other principle of ordering. And so when we accept the order that the Father gives and manifests through his Son, and through through the missions of the Son and the Spirit, we can call this um, relatively blind, but it's not anti-intellectual because we already know that the will of the Father is the source of all goodness and is a rule unto itself because it is radically and really identical with the infinite goodness that is the divine being itself. Whereas because our wills are finite and they're vertible and we struggle through that, um, we struggle through ordering the affectio commodi with the affectio justitiae. We don't have that same kind of, we need a rule outside of the will in order to rectify our will. And that is given by um, both the book of creation, but more importantly, the book of scripture, and then the elevating activity of created grace to dispose us to the uncreated gift, which again is just simply interpersonal communion with the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Okay, now that was very helpful. Thank you, Dr. Goff. I appreciated that. I never thought of the, uh, I know Bonaventure used that threefold distinction of the, the voluntas. So we can participate, as it were, in the voluntas acceptans, because as- In grace, that's, I think that, I think that is the whole point. And the, the way that we explain that participation, that activation on a personal level from the side of our creatureliness, is precisely through the metaphysical analysis of the pure perfections in their disjunctive modes, which opens up the objective capax dei of the of the created image. But then the activation is through the instrument of created grace, precisely so that we can be the uh, recipient of uncreated of uncreated grace, which is essentially the presence of the Holy Spirit, metaphorically speaking. But that presence of the Holy Spirit, that uncreated gift is actually the interpersonal communion between Father and the Son in that same spirit extended ad extra, such as to capture us in our finite mode and elevate us into that same communion. And it's on a personal level. It's that, it's that interpersonal communion, so thus you have to ultimately explain it in personal causality, I, thou, we relationships over, not as against, but as the realization of the formal resemblance between infinite will, infinite love, and finite will, and finite love. We can only enter into this communion because we have these pure perfections, right? We can truly mirror, but
but those pure perfections in the finite order are not able to reach their end, their full capacity, without a further assistance of the um, indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And God has willed to condition the indwelling of the Holy Spirit on the basis of the gift of created grace, which is an elevation of the will, put quite simply, to purify it and render it acceptable to God, both for our sake, but also in terms of fittingness, because it brings more glory to God. It's more fitting to enter into relation with the Trinity itself, with the Trinitarian persons, the three persons of the Trinity, properly disposed than just simply um, um, operating according to the our natural active powers of, of intellection and volition, which are limited to finite objects. And so God increases that capacity or disposes our capacities to enter into the ultimate point of grace, the uncreated grace, of which the created grace or created charity is the disposing cause. Um, by analogy, you might, you might consider the relationship between intellect and will. Now, now, on the one hand, the intellect for us is a sine qua non of willing. We can't will or love that which we don't know, right? Hmm. But on the other hand, the metaphysical purpose of the intellect is not simply to be an end in itself so we know stuff. And it's not simply to be viewed as a sine qua non for willing. The intellect is the dispositive condition for ordered willing and loving. You can see what I'm saying? So the intellect is a perfection in itself, but that perfection nevertheless is dispositive of the complement. So you have the origin from memory, you have the exemplification through intellect, but you have the complement through love. And so the intellect is this medium which is a perfection in itself, but it also is a sine qua non, a necessary condition for willing, but it also, and more importantly, is a disposative condition or cause for proper and ordered love. And so I think, I think that's, that's an important insight to have because then it explains how there is a certain primacy to wisdom and knowledge because it's only through um, knowing something that we can remember its source and look forward to its complement. We can only quasi-reify or objectify through a concept or a word. We don't know stuff without the intellect. But nevertheless, the intellect is not the point. It's ultimately the intellect is an instrument, relatively speaking, for love or charity. And so in the Father, he begins with this aseity, this perfect love, nested within which is perfect intellection. And because he is perfect love with perfect knowledge, he speaks through the mode of nature, but with love concomitant and approving a word, which is the image or the son of the father. And he also breathes forth through that son, through the voluntary mode, the spirit, but with intellect concomitant and understanding. Okay. Uh, that's really helpful. Honestly, very helpful. Um, Brother Charles, did you want to? I could keep asking questions, but I. I... <laughs> we should probably start wrapping up. I don't actually have the uh, the timer today, so I really have no idea how long we've been going. We've been going for almost what, two hours and forty five minutes. Well, probably two good hours. We had that nice little chat pre prelude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, good. all right anyways so should we look at moving on next time to chapter nine or do we think that we should have more time to work with chapter eight even though i think that you got through the last part at least some of the things that you were mentioning were in the very last pages of the chapter dr goff I'm, yeah, yeah, I think, you know, I, we're, we're all going to have to go back and read it. Um, but I think, I think these, uh, these points will help uh, provide guideposts uh, for the, the rereading of this chapter. I'm looking at chapter nine, and we're on week uh, 22, or lesson encounter 22. So we've got, what, eight encounters after this, and we have 
um, basically three chapters. What I'm seeing here is chapter nine is pretty lengthy. And so I don't think we will be able to reasonably get through chapter nine in one week. So we'll have to go two, two, um, and maybe, I mean, this is a long chapter. It's, it's 40 some pages long. And so I think we should probably uh, forge ahead to chapter nine, because I think it's gonna take at least two weeks to get through. All right. What do you think? I think so. I mean, one thing with chapter nine is that it is long, but it's also, I mean, I don't know how we want to approach this since it is just, at least the, some of the first sections are just a lot of text from St. Maximilian within little bits of commentary from Father Pierre. So, Um, one thing we could do is we could uh, take a look at the chapter and, and we could communicate via email um, okay. how this should go because I don't I don't know exactly just looking through the chapter what would be the most efficient way of doing it and I don't know if we want to figure this out right now it's a good idea well, yes, I think you you both definitely have the advantage on uh, you're just getting started for the day, and I'm. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's moving into the. Uh, <laughs> I think I think Andrew's in the afternoon now, so. Um, um, yeah. Okay, one possible way is looking at the first section. There, he mentions eight considerations, but. Um, I would have to see again what those are. If, yes. Okay. But at least, you know, hopefully this one is less of a mind blender. Um, then uh, one chapter set eight. Yeah, well, why don't we just, uh, why don't we just all, we can look through it and uh, send a few emails back within, let's say, let's just shoot for within two days. Okay. I'll probably figure this out. That way we'll have, we'll not uh, cut ourselves short. Okay, I'll probably take at least this week, take a backseat since I've got an exam coming up. So, um, anyways, all right, well. I think that I think that does it. All right. Well, why don't you lead us in a, in a word of prayer to close us out? Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Holy Mary Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mm -hmm.